All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. Today we have Mark Curry with us uh, from SMK Capital. Um, they do recession resistant assets, which is uh, my favorite. And they also, well, Mark's here to talk about diversi diversification and why it's important. He is also from Bend, Oregon. So the same time zone. I love having, you know, Pacific Northwest people on the show. So Mark, I'm super excited to jump into it. Thank you very much for hopping on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Gabe. Absolutely. Um, I told you before we got on here, we'd like to start with stories. I'm sure you got a good one. So why don't you take us to the beginning of your story in real estate and just tell us uh, how'd you get started? Yeah, I mean, I got started uh, kind of like a lot of people, I think, Gabe. This is uh, for me, 2005. I started investing in real estate, you know, on the side after work, bought a fixer upper, you know, then partnered with my brother on another one and doing that uh, with just family my brothers, my folks, um, partnering with each other really until 2010. We built a small portfolio, really just single family, small multifamily, a lot of uh, very active investing for sure. And so, um, you know, once you buy your first one, you either love it or you hate it. And I was <laughs> in the loving camp. And so that's- uh, Did that? That's uh, did the first start. one go well for you? I feel like that's kind of the key, whether you love it or hate it. You know, it's interesting. Um I, I moved into it initially. It ah, was okay. a fixer upper and I had a roommate and that kind of thing. And I just held it through the recession, right? That was the key to, to everything we were doing at that time is we didn't sell at the wrong time. And so it went well, uh, but we waited, gosh, until maybe nine, 10 years before we sold anything. And so had Oops, it looks we like sold that. earlier or been forced to sell, et cetera, it would probably be a different story. Yeah, there we go. We're getting a little bit of um, of internet issues, so hopefully that will clear up here soon. Um, okay. So you said, yeah, you held it through uh, through the recession, which that's what it's kind of key about real estate. Even if you buy, you know, the, the goal is to buy correctly, and that's what everybody wants to do is you buy right. But if you made a small mistake on the buying side, so long as you hold it long enough, eventually you're going to see a return. Um, so that's the key there. Even if you buy, you know, 2005, right before the crash, something that you could, well, you couldn't have predicted most likely some people did, but you know, they're, they're clairvoyant on that. And so, so you got started in a uh, single and then small multi, um, from that point, how did you guys scale past the, just you and your family? Yeah. So 2010, I, I left corporate America, I left the W2, dove into real estate investing full time, um, partnered with my father. He's a, retired uh, surgeon by trade and has been investing in real estate since the 70s. Um, and we started our company, SMK Capital Management. And we were doing two things, Gabe. First was we were continuing to buy a lot of you know heavy value add, distressed all cash purchases from the bank. And at the same time, you know, I'd left corporate world. I had a 401k. It was kind of sitting idle. And stock market was really scary and un unpredictable, of course, at the time. So I opened up a self-directed IRA and I started investing you know, passively as a limited partner um, into a bunch of other things, right? I wanted to diversify my own capital into things that had done fairly well through 2008 and 9. And there wasn't a lot, but you obviously know what those asset classes are, Gabe, but mobile home parks and Self-storage were two of our favorites. They remain two today. Um, also did apartments and several other things as well. But that's really where we I got the kick into diversification. Yeah. And you always hear when people talk about recession resistant asset classes, um, mobile home and self-storage, those are the two that top the list. Um, and I've heard a thousand different reasons of why that is. I'm just curious what your perspective is. Why are those two asset classes considered the most uh, resistant when it comes to a recession? I'll keep it simple, Gabe, for today's purposes. There's a lot of nuance we could get into. Um, there, there's kind of two things that I think about when recession resistance is, do we anticipate demand for the asset to remain consistent or possibly even increase during a recession? That's number one. Number two, do we believe that the asset valuations have a high likelihood of maintaining or increasing during a recession? 
And that to me, if you can answer yes to both those questions, you're probably in a really good recession resistant sector. Okay. Okay. And that is true for both mobile home and self-storage. Um, yep. I mean, that's all tied down to demand, really. I mean, valuations, you're not going to have an increase in valuation if there's no demand in the market for the product. And so it really just comes down to during a recession, people still need cheap places to live, which is mobile home RV parks, uh, cheapest that you can possibly get out there. And then also if, uh, if they are unfortunate and they have the, find themselves in a situation where they do need to downsize, um, they need some place to place all that stuff, which is self-storage. So, uh, yeah, it's the reasons that I like it as well. Um, it's a great asset class. Uh, it sounds like you have been in a number of different type of assets. You guys have done uh, multifamily. Have you done any like industrial retail? Yes. And yes. Yeah. We, we've invested in over a dozen, dozen different asset classes within real estate over the years. Interesting. Okay. So let's talk about your favorites. I love it when people come on and they, they're, uh, they might not have a single focus, so they are kind of dispersed across different asset classes. And so let's talk about your, the nuances between the two and, uh, why one specific asset is your favorite over others. Yeah. And I'll start quickly sharing Gabe, what we don't do. It's a longer list than what we do do, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll just run through them fast, but like we don't invest in short-term housing like Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or hotels. And reason or, for that. Let's hear it. Uh, you have more of a transient uh, user base. And so it's very hard to predict the revenue stream. We like mm. a predictable revenue stream. Yeah. Um, you tend to see higher ups and lower lows. And you know, that, that creates more risk for us, potentially more reward, but outside of our comfort zone. Yeah. Um, hospitality, lodging, same concept. Uh, we don't do senior housing. We don't really do student housing. Um, the reasoning for those two is predominantly very high expense ratios. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it takes a lot more money to operate them. And we don't typically see a reward for taking on that higher risk. The returns are roughly the same as what we do in other asset classes that we think have lower risk. Um, we've invested in a lot of others, but I'll just leave it at that for some of the no's because we want to keep going here. The yeses, you know, where we really focus today, obviously mobile homes, self-storage, um, you know, we're, we're recording this in the beginning of 2024, we're in March. So we do some apartment deals, but very specific to uh, predominantly tax exempt apartments. Those are apartments that do not have to pay property taxes. Very niche. Uh, we've been doing that for a few years. Uh, uh, so that I've, I've never heard of that a tax exempt apartment complex why is it tax exempt yeah yeah so it, it's a it's a sector where um when an escrow a partnership is created between the owners us and our operating partners and the local municip municipality and the partnership agreement basically stipulates we're going to create affordable housing at an mm. existing complex mm. Let's say there's 500 units in this apartment community, we're going to keep 250, half of them rent or income restricted. So the yeah. rents can essentially only go so high based on the local area median income. And so you're allowing more people to afford those units. They still right. have to qualify. It's not subsidized housing. They have to fill out applications, pay stubs, jobs, you name it. Um, and then the other half can be kept at market rate. And so for doing that, you get a 99-year property tax exemption starting in the first year. And so you see- 99 years, wow, okay. And it's transferable to the next buyer. So it's a very specific niche, um, very hard to do, Gabe. There's usually yeah. a team of attorneys on both sides of the table putting these deals and structures together. So, but a very big advantage for us. We love them. We, we continue to Oops, looks seek like those is. kinds of apartment deals out. Um, additional assets, by the way, Gabe, industrial, and we also invest in ATMs. Um, we also love, um, you know, real estate debt funds as well for more of a fixed income part of our portfolio. Yeah. It's funny. You're the, the second person this month who's, um, come on and talked about investing in ATMs. Um, it seems to be a, a, a popular investment out there. Um, if you get the right location, it would make sense. Uh, so real quick, I just want to, uh, close up that topic about um tax exemption so it sounds like the reese i mean it makes the your noi a little bit more predictable because you 
the variable of um, what are the taxes going to be next year is just not there. And the reason that the city wants it is because it guarantees a an, an a section of your of your complex to be affordable housing essentially so it is subsidized but not on um not on the tenant side it's the city just coming in saying you don't have these expenses anymore um so long as you provide housing at this cost and that that cost is still variable correct the the rent for the subsidized housing is still variable based on the median income of the area yeah you got it gabe so uh essentially that's what we're doing here we're creating affordable housing and uses in segments and sectors of the country that are just absolutely deficient hmm. and so these municipalities have created these kinds of programs there's actually more favorable debt by fannie and freddie out there oh, so you get seven to ten year fixed debt uh, a lot of times interest only for the whole period 75 hmm. percent loan to cost and um, oftentimes a little bit lower interest rate as well and so uh, th those are some of the benefits as an investment standpoint, you know, you're kind of removing your largest expense item. Yeah. Right but off I'm the sure. bat day one, which can yeah. be millions of dollars, you know, for the kinds of investments that we typically source for these structures. And so you have more cash flow beginning day one, which produces lower risk, right? Cause you're, you're earning a yield and a dividend right out the gate on these investments. Yeah. And I would assume that is restricted to, well, obviously, larger metros that have a housing issue, have a housing crisis, um, you know, Bend, I'm sure, uh, Seattle, Portland, um, any of those bigger metros that would be uh, needing something like this. Yeah, we, we typically do it a lot in Texas. That's one of our favorite states to invest in, has been for over eight years. But uh, uh, there's certain areas that work, certain areas doesn't work, Gabe. There's a lot of municipalities that don't provide this kind of structure. Um, and so you you have to really be specific into this niche as far as your experience and your your focus. Uh, we work with an operating partner that has been, they were in low-income low housing tax credits for a number of years. This is really their specialty. And uh, they've got, I think, 25,000 apartments under management and ownership now. And so a uh, pretty big bench on their team to be able to figure out all the, the nuance behind the structure here. Details of it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... So let's talk about self-storage. That's my, my favorite asset. Uh, in the market today, um, with interest rates go have, you know, they're seven, eight ish right now. Um, what, what kind of deals are you guys finding? And then how are you underwriting them to make sense? Um, I haven't found a great deal in a long, man, probably a year at this point. Yeah. And so, um, what are you seeing in the market and then what kind of value add are you able to create in these deals to make the sure. numbers? click for you. Yeah. I'll give you a little bit of um, kind of how we work, Gabe, right? We're not experts in every single one of these asset classes. So we're, mm. we're a boutique private equity investment firm. What does that mean? It means we get our deal flow from other real estate sponsors and operators out there, mm -hmm. uh, yep. like the you know, tax exempt apartments. We have two operating partners. Those are other real estate investment firms. All they do all day long is look for opportunities. They have an acquisitions team, they have an in-house uh, asset management team, um, HR, back office, admin accounting. Um, one of them has a staff of over 80 people full-time at their headquarters. And this is all they do. They just specialize in these kinds of assets. So we're looking at 10 to 20 deals a month. And we invest in about five to eight a year. Okay. And so roughly 97% or so of what we see, we pass on. We're trying to find something really unique. And so going back to your question about self-storage, and, and you're right, it's very hard to find great deals today across all assets, Gabe. I mean, that's been the, the story for us for uh, almost a year now. Um, I think it's actually the hardest right now than it has been since the pandemic. And that's when everything basically stopped. And so at the same time, they're out there. So I'll give you an example on self-storage. Uh, one of our operating partners that we work with they have an in-house acquisitions team of six full-time people, Gabe. All they do and all they have been doing for the last 10 years is cold calling mom and pop owners of mm -hmm. self-storage and mobile home parks. Yeah, And so they have a Rolodex of thousands of owners of these properties that they want to get in front of and continue to talk to. And they get a lot of their deal flow direct from the seller, off-market, true off-market. Um, and I was recently visiting one of their self-storage communities that we just invested in. 
and it's uh, north of Houston. Um, and I'll give you a quick story, Gabe, and then ask any questions you want. But, uh, you know, when you're trying to get somewhere, what do you do? You put it in Google Maps. You haven't been there before. So I, I could not find this self-storage facility. Ah, those are the keys. That's the what you're looking for right there. That's right. Google Maps took me to their competitor. I'm not joking. And so <laughs> that's a huge red flag, but also a huge opportunity. Yeah, it's that's what I was going to say. Yeah. This was a property that the, the, the husband and wife... Um, uh, they were an elderly, over 80 years old. The husband recently passed. They've been self-managing it for a long time. And the wife, I think, was just tired and didn't want to deal with it anymore. People would drop rent off in a little um, mailbox mm -hmm. at the front of the property and in a, in a check. And she wasn't enforcing collections. She's not advertising or marketing online. Um, you get it. And so there's a ton of upside here. And so we found that actually, uh, just to get into some of the weeds here, but an average 10 by 10 unit in that marketplace was renting for around 120, I think $125 a month. Her rents were like 84 bucks. And so you immediately have, what's that? <laughs> That's a good deal for people. It's a good deal. And the property was about 70% occupied. And so, you know, if you think about these kinds of low hanging fruit deals where you can come in and, and institute institutional management, professional management, you can really grow value um, rather quickly within the first six to 12 months. And so that's a recent stealth storage deal that we've invested in. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. I've, I've um, I bought two deals in Dallas that were that story. It was just somebody old guy completely just stopped, stopped caring about them. They weren't on Google. They weren't on, didn't have a website, just nothing, just a sign on the road. <laughs> um, and that's those it. are the best ones, but it's just like, to find those, like we have our uh, our cold callers, they use, um, well, cold calling team, but then the data team on the side of them, they literally go into Google Maps and we'll have a list of self-storage facilities that are on, you know, on Crexy and all that stuff. And so we, we instruct them to find, look on Google Maps and find facilities that don't show up on this list. You know, if, if it's on oh, Google, clever. yeah, and it I looks like, like a self-storage facility. Um, that's great. Find that. Yeah. We find that deal. No, they're, it's just really hard to find those deals. That's the problem. I know. Uh, but if know. you find them, it's great. It works out, uh, usually because they're not getting hounded every single day by investors like us. So I love it. All right, man. Well, I just took a peek at the clock. It looks like we have run it down. Um, it's time to jump into the quick question round. Are you ready? Sure. All right. It starts with, um, Education could be any form, could be books, could be movies, could be YouTube channels, whatever. Give me two recommendations, one for general life wisdom and then one for real estate. Yeah, I mean, lots of podcasts, Gabe, obviously like the one we're discussing together today. It, it, it's been huge, I think, in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so, podcasts have taken off. There's so many. Um, yours is great, of course, for real estate. For general wisdom, I'll, I'll actually reference a book. Um, I'll give you two. There's one called 12 Pillars by Jim Rohn. Mm -hmm. That's one of those books you just want to read once a year. I mean, yeah. it is just a chock full of simple steps to follow through your daily life. And uh, I would recommend it to anybody in any industry. It's really great. And then you have uh, Stephen Schwartzman, the co-founder of Blackstone. Um, what it takes is the title of that. Okay. It's just a great story about his journey through life and uh, what he's accomplished, the challenges he's overcame and kind of the mental mindset you have to have to, to obviously do what he's done, creating the largest alternative investment firm in the world um, and still be smiling and having a positive attitude. Still having a good time, not pulling you Yeah, around. exactly. Uh, yeah, I've, I've really been into um, biographies, autobiographies, that kind of stuff. Uh, it sounds like a good one. It was called What It Takes. You got it. I'll have to pick that up. All right, next question is, for your younger self, um, let's go back to the mark. Back in 2005, he was just buying that first investment property with his, uh, I believe it was your brother or something like that. Um, go back to him, look him in the eye, give him one piece of advice moving forward. He could have helped out more. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. He was too busy. It was, it was all on my shoulders as far as operations and managing it. So that's my piece of advice for him. And I guess for everybody listening is, you know, a great partner, but at the time we didn't have defined roles. And so 
Um, to find define the roles, find out what you're good at, find out what they're good at, and try and see if they're not the same thing because that's usually best. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, next question is about the U.S. It's a big place. There's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, give me the single metro, single city that you're most excited about investing in today. Gosh, that's a tough one. I got to be honest with you. I don't have a single city, Gabe. We invest in over 30 states across the U.S. I'll say, maybe I'll give you regions if that's okay. That works. We like the Midwest um, for certain asset classes. You have predictable income. You have a little lo- slower growth. But you're also seeing that some of those markets have had you know, pretty affordable rents for a long time, and they're starting to pop in the last year or so. And so um, a lot of opportunity there. Um, and then I also would go back to the South, Southeast, you know, Texas is phenomenal. We love the Texas triangle, Dallas, Houston, Austin, a lot less in Austin these days makes sense for us because we're cash flow investors, but we're doing quite well in Dallas and Houston. And those two cities continue to be top of the list for almost any economic growth indicator that we're trying to see and, and track where we can get tailwinds, right? Market tailwinds is very important for what we try and do. And, uh, you know, Texas is top of the list. Yeah, Texas is a great one. All right, next question is about uh, finding deals. You guys are equity investors. So we're just going to say, what is your favorite way to um, generate leads and find new partners to invest with? Yeah, I mean, it's all networking, honestly, Gabe. Um, we, We started networking 14 years ago. And so we've vetted and analyzed you know, 100, over 130 different sponsors that specialize in one thing. Today, we invest in it with about a dozen. And so it's a long time to come up with these relationships. Most of the time, it's a, a referral. Hey, Mark, I'm investing with these guys. You should check them out. And then we'll conduct a bunch of due diligence to see if we're a good fit. And some, it's a group that we want to invest in. But that's where we get all of our deal flow from, Gabe. Again, it's a relationship-based business for us. Yep, Absolutely. All right. Second to last question. This is about lessons learned. Um, not every deal we get into goes the way that we expect it. A lot of times a wrench is thrown into the mix, um, but that's when we get the biggest lessons that we can take on to the next deal. So what was a lesson that went a little bit sideways for you? And then uh, what was the less or what was the, what was the deal that went sideways? The lesson you pulled from it? Yeah. Um, sorry. I'm just thinking through this. So there isn't one thing, Gabe, honestly, you know, um, being in this business for a long time, you, you realize there's a trend here. It's hard. It's always hard. <laughs> um, we're always faced with new challenges from, if you think about like my experience, I'll talk about going through the recession, 2008 and the real estate crash, drop in values, drop in rents uh, that came shortly thereafter. Um, we've had fires at properties. One was a total loss. Thankfully, nobody got hurt. We worked through that. We've worked through several large storms and hurricanes that have caused significant damage to properties. Um, This all happens if you're in the business long enough. Um, We obviously worked through a global pandemic where everyone was told to stay home and stop working. And uh, most recently, the, the fastest interest rate increase in the last 40 years. And so all of these challenges have been very hard. There isn't one that I would say has been more difficult than the other and has taught me one thing. You know, for me, if you want to be in this business in the long haul, you have to have a strong spine <laughs> to deal with all these, these challenges. We're really in the problem solving business and to be successful. I think I'd say you got to build your inner confidence to a level where you believe wholeheartedly that no matter what problems arise, uh, you're going to get through them. You can handle it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's interesting. Is it the fastest interest rate increase in 40 years? That's uh, these past couple of years. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. We saw over 500 basis point increase in interest rates in about 18 months. Really interesting. Even more than like the nineties, didn't interest rates get to like 11% or something like that or the eighties? Um, when it was. So uh, if you go back to the early eighties during the savings and loan crisis, interest rates were in the high teens. Huh? That's crazy. But the, the rapid increase in interest rates is really where, where it's been most challenging. So the fed has raised rates so fast, faster than anybody predicted. We all kind of knew that interest rates were going to rise. Nobody predicted them to rise so fast. So that had a big shock on the market continuing 
today and we'll see where this year and next year go because it's a multi-year market changing effect yeah huh that's interesting um cool well that brings us to the very last question this is for the listeners um you've given us a lot to think about i'm sure people want to reach out get in contact with you where can they find you and then what can they expect when they reach out yeah so our company name is smk capital management our website is smkcap.com i send folks there because it's great to, to learn we have a lot of information on our website about market trends, what we're doing, different asset classes. We've got some case studies. You can view investment opportunities. For folks that are you know, interested in learning more about our passive investments, Gabe, they can sign up on our website um, and schedule a call directly with me and we can see if we're a good fit. I'm happy to do that. And if people don't want to go through all that, they just want to email me. My email is, you can uh, get direct in contact with me through info at smkcap.com. Perfect. I will put those links in the show notes. So if y'all want to reach out, just click the little more in the description. It'll pull down that full description and in there you can find Mark's links. All right, Mark, that wraps it up. Thank you very much for hopping on the show. My pleasure. Thank you, Gabe. Absolutely. For everybody who's here with us today, thank you guys for showing up. You are the reason we do this. So if you guys have any questions, reach out to me, Gabe at the real estate investing club.com. If you want to support the show, just give us a like, subscribe, share all that jazz. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great week. Keep rocking real estate, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.